Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the show. The UK entered a recession in 2020 due to COVID lockdowns. The economy plunged by 20% between April and June in 2020. That was businesses closing, people ordered to stay at home, of course. Uh, the GDP of the UK had fallen 2.2% between January and March. And at the time, the Office of National Statistics, the ONS, said that this is the largest quarterly contraction in the UK since ONS quarterly records began in 1955 and reflects the ongoing public health restrictions and forms of voluntary social distancing that have been put in place in response to the coronavirus pandemic. Now, whilst the majority of the world has largely moved on from the panic, uh, the pandemic, its effects still rumble with additional pressures from all the recent events that we've seen, war in Ukraine um, uh, and all sorts of other uh, challenges that we've had. Now, whilst we in the UK aren't yet in a recession, the Bank of England very recently has raised the interest rates from 1.25% to 1.75%. And this is the aim to try and curb soaring prices and warn that the UK will fall into recession at the end of this year, 2022. And it expects the economy to continue shrinking uh, through the end of the year and keep shrinking until the end of 2023. Now, they blame this decline, of course, on things like rising gas prices following the Russia's, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the impact that that's had on the energy prices and then the knock on impact that that has across uh, sectors like retail and, and car and, and transport and supply chain all over the world. So with the inflation rates and cost of living uh, rising across global economies and supply chains struggling to get past backlogs and shortages. Lots of the experts are trying to uh, are hinting uh, that an official recession is on its way and, and warnings are being given by those uh, experts to MPs that the UK will likely have some kind of at least mild recession before inflation starts to become manageable once again. And that picture is similar in the US and across the world and governments in particular are working to mitigate uh, the impact that this this can have. President Biden, for example, has written off 330 billion in student debt. Uh, Chancellor Olaf Scholz uh, announced 10 billion in tax relief packages as part of their measures in Germany. Finland's government, while their prime minister, Sana Marin, is fending off ridiculous attacks on her personal life, has announced that they will subsidize travel to work at a cost of 142 million euros. So while governments are working to support people through these um, like global economic challenges of price rises, of cost pressures, of increased inflation, of this looming recession that I mentioned, what measures can data leaders and their teams put in place to ensure they have the right focus and attention in support of the trading environment that the business finds itself uh, with uh, in? Now, for some, this will be risk management time, i.e. there'll be no particular impact right now, but the potential is there. Some industries are already facing those pressures and issues, and some industries, as always is the case in crisis and challenging times, will be thriving or plan to thrive through, through the challenges. Now, regardless, there are some measures that you can start taking today that can really get you ready to operate positively in the coming weeks, the coming months, and the coming years with this threat, with this challenge, with this, this potential for uh, recession, as I talked about. Now, the first of those is brand. Those in challenging sectors often shrink their costs and let people go. Some businesses will unfortunately not survive the squeeze. So there's likely to be a lot of people on the market, really good people on the market that are looking for jobs. Those organizations that either have the cash or the confidence or both to invest will take on more people. But you'll need to make sure you stand out if you want to take, be able to take on those people. So it's important that you build a brand around you, around your company, around your team that makes you stand out. Of course, you will need to have a strong employee value proposition overall within the company, a uh, strong enough reason why to join and, and then stay at your business once they join. But additionally, in this market, you will need to have a strong reason for data professionals to want to join your data function or the data activities that you have going on. This goes internally as well. You might want to try and um, bring in people from different departments. So you need to grab the right attention to attract the right talent into the team if you're one of those companies that are looking to take on people. And even as a long-term, mid and long-term strategy to try and drive the right attention to what you're doing so that when you do recruit, you're able to have a, a strong enough proposition that people want to join. You want to think about talking at events, start a regular blog that you release, release interviews with your team, share exciting growth plans, the things that you're working on, be a guest on a podcast. Uh, 
So build a strong message and brand around what you're doing to put you in a position to take on the right people. Now, whether that's tomorrow, whether that's in a year's time, but take the advantage while you can build a strong brand around what you're, you're trying to do. Now, secondly is iterate. One of the best ways to operate in any market, actually, not just when there's challenges, is to work iteratively, to start small and scale appropriately, grow the things that are working and drop the things that aren't. It kind of makes sense. When the economic environment is tough, though, it's even more important not to waste money on ideas, on projects, on data products, on digital solutions and changes and things like that that don't make any impact. This means you need to have a structure and a process in place where any outcome you're looking to achieve starts with a test, a prototype, something like that. Then those things that are proven successful through that stage move to a minimum viable product stage or a first release, an alpha release of what you're looking to build. And the things that are still proving to add value move to a beta and then to scaled solutions. Now, this way you invest only in the activities that are proven to add the most value. This goes for a dashboard or an algorithm or even a new way of working or process in your team. Test something, start small and scale it appropriately if it looks like it works. Now, this iterative mentality is so important when challenging times or environments and make sure that you're focusing your investment and your time, your energy and your money on the things that add most value and that are proven to add most value. Now, third is repeatability and adoption. So you'll know this similar familiar story, I'm sure, around lots of duplication with the, within the business, built, um, people creating, you know, multiple databases for, for capturing customer data or for, for building um, built data sets to build some reports from. Uh, lots of people uh, trying to build the same metrics, lots of people trying to work out, you know, taking the same data feeds from the same place multiple times, lots of people paying for external data sets that are basically the same where you lose a bit of efficiency. So lots of duplication of effort around the organization. And now is a really important time to think about repeatability, to think about reusability, to think about assets that you can build once and use many times. It really manages the costs as building once and using many is way more effective way of using money than building lots of times and lots of uh, duplication of effort, very inefficient way of doing things. And again, this could be for dashboards. This could be for data feeds. This could be for metric calculations. Let's build one measure of revenue and let everybody use that. Let's build one model for uh, I don't know, propensity model and let everybody use that. So think about ways of, of re building, re building repeatable assets, re repeatable things that you, 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 you build once and you use many times. Now, linked to repeatability is automation. You want to automate like mad. This could be a data feed. This could be metric calculations, as I said. This could be those propensity models. This could be observability routines, error handling, um, uh, auditing, those sorts of audit logs, those sorts of things. Anywhere you can take a manual process and automate it to remove cost, to make you more efficient, to redeploy people to higher value activities, now is the time to invest in that automation. Think about RPA, robotic process automation. Think about just um, uh, moving manual uh, uh, ex extract routines and automate those using an ETL tool. This is the time to do that. Finally, it's time to make sure that what is built gets used. So that could be new things that I've just mentioned, but also leveraging what you might have built over the last one, two, three years and making sure you are maximizing their use. If it's not being used and if you can't see it being used, then um, it will be costing you money with no upside. There'll be no benefit. It also has the cost, the capex or otherwise from when you built it in the first place, again, with no upside, with no benefit. If something isn't being used or no longer needed, then drop it, remove the cost, remove the support activities, remove the storage or processing fees that you're continually uh, have because you're maintaining something that isn't isn't used. So if you can't drive adoption, but let's try and make that happen, then let's remove the cost so that we're again, being really sensitive to cost pressures that we might come under. Now, fourth is about technology. And in some ways, for the things we've talked about, you might want to uh, invest in new technology to help you automate, to help you build data products, to help you be more iterative. But really, I think now's the time to kind of look at the technology that you already have within your organization, look at the investments you've already made and squeeze the hell out of them to make sure that you're getting the most from those platforms, from that, from that technology. This could be your ETL tools. If you've got two or three, let's just focus down, double down on the one that is being used the most. And we've got the most skills on and, 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 and drop the rest. If we've got 
um, uh, 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 we invested in some um, other integration or some database platform technology. Let's make sure we've got all of the brilliant functionality and features that, are, that exist within that technology being used in some way so that you're getting the most out of the technology that you invested in. Use the features, use the functions that can that can help support you through this this time. Now, fifth is my favorite, actually, which is high value focus. In again, in any environment, but really importantly, an environment where markets might be shrinking, where opportunity might be challenged, where uh, costs are put under pressure, where risk starts coming into uh, effect, you want to be laser focused on value, laser focused on the priority use cases that will add most value, laser focused on uh, use cases on business problems that have a really strong business case, a strong upside, a strong potential. And not only that, have a clear plan and route to get to that value. It's not just okay to have an idea of the value use cases that you want to go after, but it's really important that you have a plan about how you will do that and how you will get there. One of the things this does is to help you not only find the right upside, and if we work iteratively, as I mentioned before, but it helps you to manage cost because you're focusing on the right things. You're focusing on the things that add most value. You're focusing on the things that you that we are confident will add um, uh, uh, the, the right opportunities to go after that add the most value that are going to be able to build return. And whilst we're in an environment where costs are under pressure and and uh, investments are being challenged, if you can prove that you're working on the on things that support trading through difficult times, um, through thriving through difficult times, then you'll have a really strong um, uh, reason to maintain a team, to maintain investment, to carry on doing the things that you want to do. Now, it is no coincidence that the measures that I've just talked through spell birth, brand, iterate, repeatability and adoption, technology, high value focus. Some of the world's largest companies started during a recession when the chips were down and opportunity was maximized. So if we think about Netflix, they scaled off the back of the dot-com bubble bursting um, in the early 2000s. Airbnb was founded in 2008 during the Great Recession. Microsoft was founded while the US was immersed in stagflation in the 1970s. MTV made its debut in the sluggish economy in the early 80s. And even Disney was born at the height of the Great Depression. Those with a positive outlook, even in challenging times, are really able to maximize the opportunities with the right mindset, the right approach, the right focus, the right attention. And with these measures that I talked about, the uh, brand, iterate, repeatability and adoption, technology and high value focus are able to really build a robust strategy and plan that has that focus, gets the most out of the investments you make and builds a team and an approach capable of truly delivering value. I look forward to hearing your stories of recession-proof data strategies that are born in the coming weeks and months. Um, and I can't wait to hear how you've managed to uh, get ahead or, or survive or thrive through the coming uh, year. Thanks very much. Catch you soon.